chains fall, prisons shake at the sound of his name. Let's sing this out together. Chains will fall, prison shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name.
patience Come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting God so loved the world Who is the great King of glory Seated on high in the heavens Oh, Jesus you
It seemed that heaven's love had lost As Jesus hung upon the cross His broken body lay to rest As earth was filled with hopelessness Until the Son of Man began to wake Became an empty grave. Oh, the tomb became an empty grave. Yes, it did. He was the death of death when he rose to life. When the dark surrendered to the risen light. Oh, praise the Savior. Jesus Christ, the death of death is your victory. The war is won, the work is done, and hope for all the world has come. The victim never lost his crown. to celebrate because you did not stay dead you rose again and because you rose again we have hope death has no more sting we have nothing to fear because Jesus you've overcome this world fear death sin the grave and in you we have freedom freedom from our sin freedom from our past Lord in you Jesus we have a new life we're so grateful for what you've done. We worship you. You're worthy of the highest praise. We sing for you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for singing. You can go ahead and take a seat. At the beginning of the year, we started our M1 Capital Campaign. It was an ambitious dream to fund churches all across 
the world. And today we want to share with you how your contributions are making a difference across the globe. Take a look at this. We are halfway into our M1 Capital campaign. Let's take a look at what God is doing in and through the communities that Sagebrush has invested in. In Wichiwala, Panama, we have started construction on a church and youth complex, giving both adults and a younger generation a place to go. The Kuna Indian community has come together to help this dream become a reality, and we couldn't be more thankful. In Lome, Togo, Africa, a local community will have access to a church and sports complex. Ground has been broken and building has begun. The people of Lome, Togo, Africa are on their way to creating a safe environment for people to hear the word and love of God. In Omsk, Siberia, a full remodel of this historical church has taken place. As you can see, this community in Siberia has already been able to attend and enjoy church in their new building. We've begun construction on many more of these projects. Throughout Africa, Asia, and Latin America, we are seeing lives changed, communities formed, and God moving. From church training facilities to youth complexes, from entire church buildings to parsonages, people are directly benefiting from your financial support. With your help, God is giving us the opportunity to share his word, gift, and light across the world. Thank you for deciding to be a part of such a special mission, one that will change the lives and futures of so many people. If you have the desire to be a part of someone's story, visit m1.sagebrush.church or the Sagebrush app to find out more about the M1 Capital Campaign today. Isn't that exciting? Aren't you thankful to be a part of that? For those of you who might be new to Sagebrush here in the room and maybe, maybe at home, uh, we did a capital campaign. We were, uh, made pledges of over $3 million. So far, $2.8 million has already come in. And uh, we made a promise. Yeah, it's awesome. We made a promise that every dollar that got in, we wouldn't keep a dollar here. We would go fund these 59 different projects. And honestly, we didn't anticipate you guys giving so much money at the beginning of the campaign, but we sent it overseas. And right now, 51 of the 59 projects are already happening. And we believe that over 50 of the projects will be done by January. What we thought would be a two-year uh, kind of a deal to see the construction happen actually is going to be about a one-year deal for that. So I want to say thank you again for all your generosity. Generosity. Yay, God. All right, we're in the middle of a series called Troublemaker. We're going through the life of Jesus. Before I get into the talk, let's take a look at the bumper. Take a look at this. That bumper fires me up every week. And they said, do you want to play the bumper this week? I said, yes, I want to play the bumper this week. I'm ready to go, all right? An elderly man was lying there in his bed. He was dying. Hospice had been called. He was told that he only had a few days left to live. He was drifting in and out of consciousness when all of a sudden he smelled his favorite chocolate chip cookie. He thought to himself, have I already died? Have I already gone to heaven? Or is this one more act of love and devotion from my wife of over 50 years? Well, he called out to find out what was going on with the cookie situation, but no one heard him cry out. So he thought, I'm going to muster up all the strength I've got, go down and get myself a chocolate chip cookie. So he rose up in the bed, he stood up, and he had to lean a little bit against the wall to kind of catch his balance. And then one little small step after another, he began to walk out of his bedroom. He got to the doorway of his bedroom. He was absolutely exhausted, but he could smell the aroma of those amazing chocolate chip cookies. He just had to have one. So he walked slowly out into the hallway, got to the top of the steps, put his hands on both of the railings, and one by one, he slowly went down the steps. He is completely exhausted at this point. He turns the corner. He's got just a small hallway to go, and then there's the kitchen. So he begins to walk down the hallway. He stands there in the doorway, and there before his eyes are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of his favorite chocolate chip cookies. He can hardly believe his eyes. He begins to take some steps towards the kitchen table to get a cookie, but he falls 
down out of strength. He's down on his knees. He raises his hand, trembling to get one chocolate chip cookie when all of a sudden a spatula hits him in the back of his hand. He looks up. There's his wife of over 50 years, and she looks at him and says, don't touch those. They're for the funeral. (laughs) Now, that's some messed up stuff right there, right? Today, we're going to talk about temptation. Wouldn't it be wonderful if temptation was a one and done kind of thing? But you know as well as I do that temptation is relentless. And every time you and I are tempted, it is an opportunity to be less than what God wants us to be. We're in the middle of this series called Troublemaker. We're going through the life of Jesus. We've seen his birth. We've seen what happened to him when he was 12 years old. Last week, we talked about what his first act of ministry was, which was getting baptized, and then Jesus commands anyone who proclaims him to be the leader and uh, follower of his life to to also be baptized as well. And I'm so proud of so many of you, because 88 people signed up to get baptized at our next baptism. Isn't that fantastic? That's so great. So now Jesus has gotten baptized. He's on a spiritual high. I want you to see what happens next. Chapter 4 of Luke, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. Now, Jesus is on a spiritual high. Friends, the greatest time that you have to be tempted is when you find yourself coming down from a spiritual high. The Trinity was in full effect on Jesus' baptism, right? We do not worship three different gods. We have one God that's appeared to us in three different forms. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus is in the water. God the Son getting baptized. Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove. And then we have God the Father saying, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. It had to be amazing to be there on this particular day. And then the Bible says that Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness where he is tempted by Satan himself. Now, I don't know if you've ever been tempted by Satan or not. I I can tell you this, that Satan is an angel and that he can only be in one place at a time. And I highly doubt you're on his top ten list. Okay, no offense. Some of you think the devil made you do it. I don't think the devil had anything to do with it at all. I think he was even around. I think he was over doing something else with somebody else. You understand? I don't think you're on the top 10 list of Satan. I don't think you and I are that big of a threat. I think he's got bigger fish to fry in our world today. Just look at the news and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, right? And so I think we believe that Satan has got his demons and they're very well organized. But most of the temptations that you and I face, are you ready for this? Come from ourselves. They come from our sinful nature. They come from our own evil desires. And how do I know that? Because that's what the book of James says. James chapter 1 verse 14 says, Each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he's dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it's full grown gives birth to death. Let me explain to you how every temptation you've ever had begins. It always begins with a thought. Always does. Every sin you've ever committed began with a thought. That's why the Bible says you take every thought and you make it obedient to Jesus Christ. You ask yourself, is this something that Jesus would have me think about? Because if I keep this in my mind, I'm going to act on this. So you start thinking about what you want to do that you know probably isn't the best thing for your life, right? Then you begin to imagine doing that, and then you desire it. You find yourself manipulating situations, being in places that you shouldn't be, hoping that maybe somehow, some way, you might get to involve yourself in what you've been thinking and imagining about. Now think about it. You've thought about it. You've imagined it. You've desired it. There's only one thing left to do, and that's to act upon it. And sometimes temptation can go through those four cycles just in an instant, just like that in a flash. And sometimes it takes days, even weeks, as we think about it, imagine and desire it. Well, here we have Jesus. He's out in the wilderness being tempted by Satan himself for 40 days and for 40 nights. And the Bible says that Jesus hasn't had anything to eat. He's been fasting. Now, let me explain 
what fasting is. Uh, some of you are on those uh, sports apps where they're talking about intermittent fasting. So you know what that is. That's where you go without food for like 16 hours, and then for eight hours you eat as much as you possibly can, right? That's basically what you do. And then you starve yourself for 16 hours, and you do that day after day. This is not the kind of fasting we're talking about in the Bible. Fasting in the Bible was to seek direction from God. So when you weren't certain what to do, weren't certain what direction to go, you would get along with the Lord and you would spend the time that you would normally prepare the food or you would eat the food and you would spend that time seeking the will and seeking the direction of what God would have you to do. Now, I hate to admit this, but I've never been much of a faster. I like food an awful lot, okay? So I know it doesn't make me sound very spiritual. I do have to say that I fasted. I have fasted one time in my life. And it was when I was in college, I was dating this girl, and she wanted to do a DTR. She wanted to define the relationship, and I didn't want to define the relationship. I was fine with what we were going on, with how the relationship was going, but she wanted to define it. And she said, we ought to fast for two or three days to see where this relationship is going. I said, you want to fast two or three days? She said, yeah, I want to fast two or three days. I said, fine, I will fast for two or three days. So the next morning, I got up. Now, the time you normally prepare for a meal or you're eating the meal, that's the time you're reading scripture, you're praying. So during breakfast, I prayed that God would give me direction in that relationship. And then during lunch, I prayed that God would give me wisdom. And then during dinner, I prayed that God would give me a pizza because I was hungry at that point in time. And because Domino's delivers, I ordered a large pizza. I hate to admit this. And I ate the whole thing. I did. I ate the whole large pizza on my own. And I found out something very important. I found out that I love pizza more than I cared about that girl. That's what I found out in that situation, all right? Now, Jesus has been fasting for 40 days and for 40 nights. He's in a weakened state, so Satan begins these temptations. Look at the first one. Write this down if you're taking notes. It's the lust of the flesh. Jesus has been without food for 40 days. He's starving. Satan comes to him and says, if you're the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Come on, Jesus, if you're really the son of God, go ahead and prove it right here and now. Satisfy your fleshly desires. Gratify yourself in this moment. Let me tell you something about your own evil desire and about Satan's temptations. He wants you to do it immediately. I mean, there, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of stones that look like bread all throughout that wilderness where Jesus is at. He said, hey, man, you're hungry. Go ahead and satisfy your appetite right now. There's nothing to think about. Just go ahead and take care of yourself. I mean, if it feels good, Jesus, you go ahead and you do it. Let me tell you something that'll help you an awful lot. God's never in a hurry, but Satan always is. Let me say that again. If you feel pressure to make a decision and you're not certain the decision you're making is something that is honoring to God, you should not make the decision. Satan doesn't want you to think it through. He wants you to be an impulse kind of a person. He wants you to do it, and he wants you to do it right now. He doesn't want you to think about the consequences. He doesn't want you to think about the long-term effects. Think about this. How many people fall into this trap? Hey, man, don't wait till you get married. Go ahead and have sex now. Go ahead and do it now. Don't wait till you can afford that house. Go ahead and leverage everything you've got and buy the house now. Let me talk to the ladies here for just a second. You see that purse? Oh, honey, hush. It looks so good. And it brings out the sparkle and the color of your eyes and the shoes. Oh, you got to have the shoes too. And they're both on sale and they'll never be on sale like this ever before. And I know you can't afford it, but that's why you have a credit card, right? So buy it now. Not saying anyone here can relate to what I just said. That's what he does to us, doesn't he? I want you to get the second thing here, is that he's trying to make, he's he's attacking Jesus at his most vulnerable point. Jesus is starving. He's very, very hungry. So the first thing he does is say, you know what? I'm going to hit you at your greatest weakness. Go ahead, turn these stones into bread. Can I tell you about temptation? It will come at your weakest point. Wherever you're the weakest, wherever you're the most vulnerable, you're going to be attacked in that area again and again and again and again. So we got to ask ourselves a question, what's your most vulnerable point? Where are you the weakest? 
Seems like every week we hear of another marriage burning, just burning out, falling apart. And, and, I, and I always think when I, when I hear that, I think, did they do the hard work? Did they make Jesus the centerpiece of their relationship? Did they serve each other? Did they put Jesus as the centerpiece of their marriage? Did they, did they seek God on their knees through prayer? Did they read the word of God? Were they memorizing and meditating the word of God? Were they caring about the other person more than they cared about themselves? Or, or did they let stubbornness get the best of them? And then over time, they began to drift apart because they weren't doing the things that God's word says that we should be doing to have a healthy relationship. So you find yourself at work, and there's a coworker there, and you find yourself somewhat attracted to them. And they're saying things to you that your spouse doesn't say to you. Or there's a friend of yours. Maybe it's your wife's friend. Maybe it's your husband's friend. And all of a sudden, you find yourself a little bit more attracted to them. They are more complimentary of you than even your spouse is of you. And you find yourself flirting with them. You find yourself thinking about being with them, imagining being with them, desiring to be with them. It's your point of greatest weakness. And I'm just going to warn you, you're going to find yourself in a place you never wanted to be. Doing that you never wanted to do, and you're going to have an amazing amount of shame and regret as a result of giving in to that weakness, giving in to that temptation. For some of us, if we're honest, the greatest weakness you've got is alcohol or it's drugs. That there was a day you were consumed by it. I mean, whenever you were stressed out, whenever you didn't know what to do, you didn't turn to Jesus. You didn't know who Jesus was. You turned to a bottle. And the bottle relieved you, but it also destroyed you at the same time. Your marriage began to fail. Your kids didn't look up to you, didn't respect you. All of a sudden, one day you came to your senses. Said, so, you know what, this isn't the life that God has for me. And you repented of that. And you've been going to Alcoholics Anonymous. Maybe you've been going to Living Free. And you're doing so good. But my goodness, it's a stressful world that we live in, isn't it? And every day something else has gone crazy, right? And you think to yourself, you know what? I, I, I know I need to lean on the Holy Spirit of God that lives in me, but i got a couple of friends that says after work, well, I'm going to go to the bar and just have a couple of drinks and just let off some steam. And you're weak in that area. You're vulnerable in that area. And you're thinking about going and you're doing it. For some of you, it's your smartphone. It's late at night, you can't sleep, and so what do you do? You go back to those things that you said you wouldn't go back to. You go look at those images, you look at those videos, and you tell yourself, I need just a little release. But you know what that's going to happen, because you've given into it before, and it's a cycle of shame, isn't it? It's a cycle of regret. And the Bible says, as a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool returns to his folly. And you go back to that which you know is slowly destroying the closeness and the intimacy that you so desperately want to have with the Lord. For others of us, your greatest weakness is your mouth. You're an exaggerator. You're a liar. You're a nagger. You're a griper. You're a complainer. And everybody around you knows it. And you're kind of getting the reputation for being the person who's so negative. And nobody really wants to be around you anymore. So you realize it. You say, I don't want to be like that anymore. And you begin to pray, oh God, set a guard over my mouth that I might not sin against you. Oh God, may the words in my mouth and the meditation in my heart be pleasing in your sight. Oh my Lord, my rock and my redeemer. My goodness, you think about the Old Testament and all those people, the children of Israel, being rescued from slavery. And then they're griping and moaning and groaning and complaining. And God wasn't pleased with them. He said, I don't want to be like them, Lord. And you find yourself gossiping and exaggerating and lying. And every day is another opportunity to either be an encourager or to be a discourager. And that's your greatest point of weakness. Others of you, you're on a diet right now. You're at a restaurant one night. You're eating that dry salad because you're dipping your fork in the dressing. You ever done that? Because you don't want to put too much dressing on the salad. Because that salad, that's a high-calorie salad. So you dip your fork and you eat the dry lettuce. And your friend right across the way just ordered the chocolate thunder from down under. You know what I'm saying? And you're tempted. You're like, I want to eat that. I want to shove that in your face, right? That's the way that works. What's your greatest weakness? If your own evil desire or Satan was out to get you, what part of your life would he come at you? You ever seen a bug zapper? 
Bug zappers are big time in the Midwest and in the South because there's so many bugs. We're kind of fortunate in Albuquerque we don't have that many bugs. But I remember many nights of uh, being there in the Midwest outside, and you would hear that thing zap, 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 just like that. Isn't that something? A whole bunch of bugs are dying, and I'm glad in Jesus' name. You know what I mean? That's what that is right there. I brought a, a bug zapper with me today. You ever seen a bug zapper and you look at the bug zapper and you think to yourself, what in the world is wrong with bugs? I mean, my goodness, after you've heard hundreds of bugs go into this thing and be zapped, you would think maybe bug 101 or 102 would go, I probably need to fly away from this and not get so close to it. But they don't do that, do they? Now, I've never read a bug's mind. I don't know what a bug's thinking, but what do you bet that bug's thinking? I can get really close to this. Oh, oh, they're one of my friends. Oh, he's dead. Oh, that's too bad, but I'm the exception to the rule. He got too close. I can just hang by it. I can just be as close as I want to be, but I won't get too close because I don't want to get zapped. Hi. Of course, you know it's a matter of time, isn't it? Before the bug gets into the trap and he gets zapped. The capacity of the human brain to deceive itself, to think that they can get as close to the fire without getting burned, is ridiculous, isn't it? We should be running away from sin. We should be running away from temptation. But you know what I find in my own life and probably in yours? We keep getting as close to this as possible, thinking that we're the exception to the rule. And you've been zapped. And how do you know you've been zapped? Because you got the regret. You've got the shame. You wish you could go back in time and do it differently. Satan comes to Jesus, listen, you're hungry on here. You're going to satisfy your own pleasure, your own desires. Just go ahead and make these stones into bread right now. And what did Jesus say? He said, man doesn't live on bread alone. Jesus says, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm here to please God. I'm not, I'm not here to somehow satisfy my longings or to satisfy my desires. I'm here for God and for God alone. So I've got to ask you a question. Is that your desire? I mean, is that why we're here? Have we, have we finally settled that we're here for him and for him alone? Or is there some confusion about that? Because I, I, I know in my own life there's been confusion. I'm sure in your life there's been some confusion. I'm just telling you, when you're confused about who you're living for and what you're living for, it's just a matter of time before you get zapped. God's looking for people whose hearts are fully devoted to him. So that's the lust of the flesh. Let's look at the next thing that happens. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I'll give all their authority and splendor, for it's been given to me, and I can give it to anyone that I want to. This is the lust of the eyes. Satan says, you want power? I'll give it to you. You want to be in charge? I'll make you in charge so fast, make your head spin. And here's the great news, Jesus. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to have those nine-inch nails in your hands and feet. No, no, no. No crown of thorns for you. Nobody going to be spitting in your face, Jesus. All you got to do is make a small compromise. Bow down before me. I'll give it all to you. That's the way he gets us. That's the way we deceive ourselves. One small compromise, and then before you know it, you end up far away from where you thought you would be. There was a college professor. Every year he had a mission trip to Haiti, and he took college kids with him. And there was one particular kid, his name was Charlie. And Charlie was so blown away by what he saw in Haiti. He, he saw the medical facilities. He saw the medical condition of the people, the supplies that were, they were always low on, the fact they didn't have qualified doctors to work there. And while he was there in Haiti, he knew that he knew that he knew that he knew that God had called him to go back. That God had called him to rescue the perishing and care for the dying. That this was the country that he needed to make a difference in. So he went to school, got his medical degree. Of course, he and the professor lost touch. Many years went by. One day the professor is walking down the street. Charlie's walking the other way. Professor recognizes Charlie. Charlie recognizes the professor. They have a conversation. Professor says, hey, Charlie, what are you doing with your life? And he's expecting him to say, you know, I'm just on break right now from Haiti. We've been doing this great work. I've been helping all these people. But Charlie didn't say that. He said, well, I graduated from medical school. The professor said, well, that's wonderful. What are you doing with that degree? He said, plastic surgery. 
He said, that's fantastic, Charlie. Are you fixing people's faces after car accidents? Are you helping kids who were born with cleft palates? What, what are you doing with this plastic surgery? He said, I'm doing breast implants. Breast implants. And he began to brag about the church that he went to and how much money he gave to it and all the causes he was supporting. The professor listened to him. Then the professor broke in the mid-sentence of what Charlie was bragging about. And he said, you know what, Charlie? I just think you're a sellout. Charlie said, what do you mean? You had a dream. You had a calling from God. You knew exactly what you were supposed to be about. You knew what you were supposed to leverage your time and your talent and your gifts for. You made a big deal to let everybody know about God's call upon your life. You were supposed to go to Haiti Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, and look at what you're doing. You're a sellout, Charlie. Well, was the professor too harsh? I'll let you decide. But we can't argue with the fact that the man had a calling upon his life and he ignored it. A calling from God of what could be, of what should be. Of what must be. And the professor looked at him and said, You sold it all for a hot tub and a Ferrari. You have a dream, a God given dream of what your life is supposed to be about, of the impact that you're supposed to make with your one shot at life. Don't let small compromises lead you to a less than kind of a life. Jesus looked at Satan and he said, It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus looked at Satan and said, I'm only interested in one kingdom, and that's God's. And for many of us, I'm just going to be honest, the reason that we're miserable, the reason that we're empty is because our heart is divided. We're still trying to make our name great. We're still trying to build our kingdom of mud. And we're not lifting up the name of Jesus. And we're not building up his kingdom. And we're still trying to chase the best of both worlds. And a divided heart is a miserable life. So Jesus said, no, I'm just going to worship the Lord my God. That's all I'm here for. I'm here for an audience of one. Look at what happens next. The devil led him to Jerusalem. Had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it's written, he'll command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They'll lift, up, lift you up in their hands so that you won't strike your foot against a stone. This is the lust of pride. Satan says, listen, I got a great idea. Why don't you throw yourself down from the temple mount? God will rescue you through his angels. Now here's what's interesting. He's quoting scripture. He's quoting Psalm 91. Satan loves to twist scripture. But Jesus knew the next verse. Because he loves me, says Psalm 91 verse 14, says the Lord. I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. Jesus said, I don't need to do a trick for these people. I I didn't come for their approval anyway. I came for the approval of God. I came to do his will. I came to do his bidding. You become a very dangerous person to the forces of evil when you could care less what anybody else says or thinks of you. And the only opinion that matters is the opinion of God. Jesus said, it said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And then the Bible says that Satan left Jesus until another opportune time. Friends, he's always looking for an opportune time. So how do we make certain that we overcome temptation and we get to the end of our life without pain, without shame, without regret? Three thoughts. Write these down. Number one, know your weakness and take whatever measures necessary to conquer it with God's help. When I asked you earlier, what's your greatest weakness? What came to your mind? What is it? Define it. Speak it. Say it. Write it down. Admit it to somebody else. If I was going to shipwreck my life, This is how I would do it. And then formulate a plan so that weakness never gets you. These are the places I can't go to anymore. Because I know if I go to these places, I'm going to shipwreck my life. These are the people I can't hang around with anymore. Because these people are tearing me down. They're not lifting me up. I've got to distance myself from these people. 
This is the accountability partner that I'm going to have in my life. And please don't tell me your accountability partner is your wife or your husband. You've got to find a guy, guys. You've got to find a gal, gals. And you've got to be honest with them and say, if I was to shipwreck my life, this is how I would do it. And I need to meet with you weekly or biweekly. And I need you to look me in the eye and ask me the hard questions. Have I been messing with something I shouldn't be messing with? Have I been negotiating my time to do things that I shouldn't be doing? Am I desiring something I shouldn't be desiring? And if you're going to do this accountability thing, here's the last question you should always ask in an accountability relationship. Have you just lied to me? Because again, the human mind to lie to ourselves and lie to others is unbelievable, isn't it? Did you tell me the truth? If you don't put those types of things into practice, it's just a matter of time before you get zapped. And you know that's true. Because you've been zapped. Because you didn't know your weakness and you didn't put a plan together to make sure you didn't go down the same path that you promised yourself you'd never go down again. Let me give you the second one. you got to get into God's Word. Every single time Jesus spoke back to Satan, he used the Word of God. He said over and over again, it is written. It is written. The Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. You've got to memorize, you've got to meditate upon the word of God. The word of God is the Christian's true north. Doesn't matter what culture says. Doesn't matter what society says. The only thing that matters is thus saith the Lord. And so if you don't know what God's word says, it's going to be easy for you to be deceived to believe that the truth is what someone else says when the truth is what God's word says. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the divine of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So get a Bible that's easy to read and start reading it. Use the New Testament plan on the Sagebrush app and get in a small group as iron sharpens iron. As That's how one brother sharpens another brother. And then lastly, decide who you're going to live your life for. Now that one seems silly, doesn't it? Because the vast majority of us here and and those watching from home, you've already decided, right, who you're going to live your life for. I mean, you made a big deal about making a commitment to Jesus Christ. You say, I love the Lord my God with all my heart and soul and mind and strength. Why do we struggle with sin and temptation? Because we're still trying to live for ourselves. I thought this had been decided. Who are we going to live our life for? There's an old hymn called I Surrender All. You know that one? All to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. And then the chorus goes, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to him, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. How many times have you sung that? Have we ever lived that one time? I, I hate that song. Because every time I sing that song, I think, well, you know, I surrender all except for this. And I surrender all except for that. Who are we living for? All of us are going to serve somebody. And all of us are going to serve something. So who are you going to serve? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. No turning back. No turning back. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, sober us up to the realities that are all around us. There are things that we can mess with that will make us less than. And we all know it because we've done those things before. We don't want to keep walking that path. We want to walk a new path. So Lord, give us wisdom. Give us a heart that takes this seriously. Help us to know our weakness and put a play together so that we never allow that weakness to get the best of us. Help us to entrench ourselves in your word to love your word, to memorize your word, to study your word. And Lord, right here, right now, help us to decide that you're more important than anything this world affords. That even though it glitters and it tries to get our attention, in the end, it will lead to our destruction. Help us to discern between what is good and what is best. 
I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. No fear is ever gonna save this ground. No past is ever gonna count me out. No lie is ever gonna keep me bound. No battle's ever gonna shake. step today or if you'd like to speak to a pastor about a temptation that you've been facing for far too long our team is ready to help call or text us at 505-922-9200 if you've been thinking about getting baptized we have the perfect opportunity just around the corner july 9th and 10th we will be having special outdoor baptisms after each of our services at all of our physical locations this is your sign to register to get baptized Visit sagebrush.church slash baptism to sign up today. We can't wait to celebrate this incredible step with you. Earlier, you heard about some of the amazing things already happening across the globe thanks to the M1 Capital Campaign. If you'd like to hear more about some of these incredible opportunities, 
visit m1.sagebrush.church. You can be a part of this campaign by visiting our website or through the Give tab on the Sagebrush app. God has already been moving in really big ways through the M1 Capital Campaign, and we can't wait to see how much more He will continue to do throughout the rest of the year. We hope you have a wonderful week, and we look forward to seeing you next time.